Yo guys, I've got a spark which I'm going to use to ignite the fire for another Skarda Week video. Today we're reviewing none other than Skarda Swap Force, royally known as the third entry of the Skarda franchise, as released in October of 2013. So without further ado, let's get right into it. The story this time around revolves around the eruption of Mount Cloudbreak, a magical volcano where ancient elementals gather to replenish the magic in Skylands. After a battle to defend the volcano from the forces of darkness, the Swap Force wound up trapped within the explosion, granting them abilities to swap top and bottom halves with one another. Now it's 100 years later and the volcano is ready to erupt once again, so Chaos has revolved his entire plan around the eruption for this, you know, century in other words, and he's going to utilise his newly discovered petrified darkness too, and I literally quote him on this one, evil eyes, with air quotations, an ancient elementals so that when the four of them reunite to cause the eruption of Mount Cloudbreak, darkness will be spread across Skylands rather than magic due to the uh, one of the elementals having been evilized, again with air quotations. Now once again it's a rather basic story, the main game is around 8 hours long if you're not rushing things, it could certainly be longer and that isn't to the game's benefit because that amount of story can't be stretched across that amount of runtime simply put most levels are filler orientated content with own which only slightly drive the story forward by the smallest inch is what i'm trying to go as far to say here but there is more notable effort put into the story this time around so that's nice there was clearly just a lot more thought put into this story and giving birth to its gimmick characters than what there were in Skarda games preceding it. And for cutscenes this time around are also more thoughtful, it seems, because they are easily the funniest we've seen yet, with NPCs having excellent chemistry with one another. Or well, the main ones at least. Side characters are all new. Every previous character except for Flynn and Eon are nowhere to be seen in this game and naturally that means there are no familiar faces to look out for and since these characters and their personalities need to be built from the ground up um, it doesn't really provide us with anything that we haven't seen before from characters and NPC in Skylanders which causes them to be one dimensional and dull. Because, you know, there's nothing wrong with drawing from characters that have already been built up and developed in previous games, but unfortunately we don't get any of that. And really all there is to do with these side characters is just watch as they talk at you. If there's no charm or charisma to be found, you don't find yourself actively seeking them out because you don't necessarily enjoy what they have to say, with the exception of Snaggle Scale, of course. His dialogue is distinctly hilarious. The developers clearly had a lot of fun writing for him, as if they even did write for him. As far as I'm concerned, they just, you know sat down someone in a room and just told him to not stop talking for 10 hours straight and I'm sure that you know that was great fun for everyone involved because you know the delivery of this dialogue has just such a comedic prowess to it I love it but of course not all the new NPCs are bad. I mentioned previously about chemistry, and naturally what I was referring to was the chemistry between Tessa, Flynn, and Sharpfin. They all bounce off each other very nicely with distinctive character traits that really um, contrast one another, and overall they carry the disappointment of all of the other M M NPCs on their backs. So thank heavens we had them to salvage this entire operation. <laughs> Now, unfortunately for this game, it does bring back a lot of the flaws behind the level settings of Spyro's Adventure, with having sets of levels that are the exact same setting, one after the other after the other. And worse yet, these levels are twice as long, so next thing you know, you're stuck for two and a half hours with the same level of theming. And the themes they've chosen are generic ones too, which don't even resemble elements of Skylands, so it's not even cleverly tied into the game at hand, it's just your generic jungle, desert, ice, forest, and evil fortress type level settings, and every single video game ever made has those. Yeah, it makes all of the levels feel lazy and devoid of creativity, because the levels are so long, and you spend so much time with the same generic setting that we've seen done better countless times before, and all of this puts a huge drag on the pacing with levels really mashing together due to them not really having anything to distinguish them and have them stand out from one another. 
However, there are a few exceptions. The level you see before you is known as Motley Fill, my favourite level in the entirety of this game, and it's a level where you chase down Baron Von Shellshock in a junkyard. It's fast-paced and offers great progression as you slowly edge closer to defeating the Baron. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself with that name reference. And it's built up around a junkyard, so that gives it some very unique textures and segments involving platforming and combat, which you don't really see anywhere else in the game, and there's also an element of desperation throughout the level, as Whiskers, a friend of yours, is evilized, and you really want to save him, so the stakes and the build of the stage are unique and fast-paced, and they really are great at helping this setting stand out from the rest of the desert stages and naturally it's where the creativity starts to seep back into the game because there's also Frostfest Mountains a few levels later which gives you a nice breather with the Frostfest games which are completely optional side missions where you can go apple bobbing or attempt memory games they're really great distractions on top of that the level is perfect in length so it's not needlessly as long as other levels and collectibles are very cleverly placed I wish all levels got the same treatment and their level design as these two standouts did I mean with both the Frostfest Mountains and Motleyville when it came to collectibles. What was so clever about them is that later on in the stage you could see ledges and perks where collectibles were hidden and so naturally you know where they're hidden. You just need to go out of your way to try and find those hiding spots and that was a really clever way to encourage your exploration. You know that there's some rewards waiting for you so now all you've got to do is find a specific way to get them just like that collectible right there. You saw a times one counter earlier in the level and then once you got to a later point in the level all you needed to do was find the exact location that you saw that collectible was in already. Very clever design work and it does reward loot full gaming. You know, you can um, play through the stages again and again and just pick out these collectibles and once you finally find them there's just no end to your satisfaction you can go as far to say but easily the most innovative addition to this game is for the refinement of mechanics due to swap force characters being able to swap top halves it creates unique chains of attacks for you to experience with as certain attacks from top halves combine themselves better with certain attacks of the bottom halves than what other combinations do it's constantly encouraged for you to swap out your Skylanders halves with dual elemental gates which need two different elements to be pre uh, present simultaneously to open. You can do this either in co-op with two different Skylanders or simply just swap out your swap force characters so you have a combination of two elements. You need to physically manipulate the figure and so taking a toy Swapping out its combination and then placing it onto the portal and watching that same combination appear in game is nothing short of magical. And the fact that this offers up so many choices and play styles makes every swap freshen up the gameplay and it becomes really rewarding to experiment with different combinations and sometimes making different combinations is comedic in and of itself because there are some very goofy combinations available in this game. They look ridiculous and that's all part of the charm. On top of that, the interactivity with the physical toys themselves being innovated upon the game. Um, there's also, on top of all that, even a jump button. And the level design takes full advantage of that, with memorable platforming segments which are fast paced and really spice up the gameplay to give you something to do outside of fighting enemies. And better yet, because it's mapped to a button, it's jumping ability, you have more controllability over your jumps. You fall slower and have more control whilst in the air than what you ever did with bounce pads and it adds an extra layer of depth to the combat as well as you can now jump to avoid attacks and that can give you more options in the midst of battle to contemplate and so playing the game is well more rewarding knowing that you have a more complicated of uh, chain of choices than what you did before and yes, I love the addition of a jump button. It doesn't harm the puzzles neither, because you know you still need to push blocks. But they've made it so that you can't get on top of them to traverse them so easily. So instead, you still need to push them as you would to get around them, rather than necessarily having to get on top of them to connect yourself between one path and the other one. And so naturally, if these puzzles aren't completely brainless and that still maintains the satisfaction of solving them as they did with the previous games. 
For levels, also make up the beans so long by giving you checkpoints halfway through, so if you must take a break, you can turn off your console, come back later and continue from that checkpoint. On top of that, there are also a greater number of collectibles, um, but unfortunately, whilst they increase for collectibles and quantity, they don't necessarily increase for quality, because most of them are just there to give you an extra thing to collect to earn stars. But still, it's nice to have um, these more wide, uh, wider areas even feel more fuller and less barren since there's just more pumped into these levels for you to discover quantity-wise because, again, they are long and can drag these levels. And on the bright side, this is the true next-gen Skarners game. It's a huge step up from Giants in terms of the physics engine and the graphical capabilities of the game since they were completely expanded upon to look fantastic. Colours really pop with a vivid and colourful palette and textures are flush and full to brim with detail with excellent animation and background details to truly invest you into the context of a level. It's great world building since ice museums have frozen fossils making it, well, an ice museum. It's genius detail which adds subtle awesomeness to the levels to truly build a story around these individual levels and it almost makes up for the constant rehashing of themes. Almost. Now this is the first Skarnas entry to be, re be released on PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. In fact, this game was a launch title for both of those systems, and so on top of the incredible HD graphics, the game also performs much better with quick and snappy loading screens. In fact, most of the time, you will never even see a loading screen when you boot up the game because the game actually loads whilst cutscenes are playing out. And as I said earlier, cutscenes are entertaining and much better than just staring at a loading screen. So yes, I love the next-gen feel of this game and the love and passion put into it by the developers. Vicarious Visions clearly, clearly loved their craft and in the process made a really, really fleshed out game, which is so much fun. And physically, when playing with the toys and making new combinations and seeing all that appear in game to give to deliver us with the greatest gameplay mechanics and chain of events um, for your characters to attack with is just so much fun to explore and on top of that you have a fast paced platforming and the combat is as progressive in nature due to the upgrade chamber as always so there's definitely a lot of fun to explore with this game and the fact that the jumping adds an extra layer uh, to the combat makes it just all the more refined i love this depth to it and just the manner in which attacks flow together especially when you find a great combination which really adds to the rewards of you experimenting around with all the different swap force toys the game has the largest amount of post-game material of any Skarners game, however, this game proves why the phrase less is more exists, once again that is with quote, uh, air quotes, and since most of um, these post-game options are tackling the same levels and missions you've already completed just with adjusted objectives to add further challenges to these tasks you've done already, and that's where my phrase less is more comes in. If they had less post-game content and they could have refined it and made it of even more greater quantity but instead we're left with something that feels rather lazy and starts becoming a chore because these levels were te tedious and repetitive enough already at least bonus mission maps were added to this game because they are short snappy little missions with really creative setups and they also have timers and a score multiplier which decreases as you're hit so you in order to earn high scores you need to speed through the bonus mission as well as get hit as minimal as possible and that makes these bonus mission maps short snappy creatively designed and beyond fun I thoroughly enjoy these missions and wish that all the other post-game content had this level of quality. But hey, at least there is all this extra stuff to do. They didn't need to pump us full with this much content, and yet they did so anyway to ensure that there's plenty of stuff to do after you've beaten the main game. And speaking of the main game, there is a hub world involved known as Woodbro, and it's a lot better than that of Giants. It's larger, more explorable, and far more creative. You have so much fun traversing this than what you do for Dreadyard, as portions of the hub world unlock progressively throughout the game, unlike they did with Giants. So naturally, you have that increased motivation to play through the game in order to open up areas of the hub world that weren't open to you previously. 
But finally, I want to touch upon the music, because once again, we have the return of Lawn Valve. And whilst I think the Giant soundtrack overall was great, the music here is still absolutely phenomenal, as you can hear in the background. It carries over everything which made the previous soundtrack so great. Its sense of scope and the loud booms and bangs, its conventional tones and noises to make it feel as though it's part of a game's world, to ultimately improve your connection with this world, and due to the nature and pacing of the sound of the music, it can make the levels feel less of a drag um, at moments in time. So in conclusion, the music in this game is great, as we've come to expect from the Skarnas franchise. Gameplay is at its very finest yet, as it truly offers the next-gen experience for the Xbox and PlayStation, with refined graphics and really great details to help colours pop and textures look flush. Plus, the loading screens are short and really of no issue, but unfortunately, I can't say the same for the Wii port because the game's performance seriously is terrible for that console. It simply cannot run the game as well as the next gen systems can. But besides a really terrible Wii port that is not worth your time nor money, the long winded levels and recycled level themes can also bring the game to an absolute drag and act as the main flaw of this game, really. And collectibles are absolutely everywhere despite the level design, which is good to see because it's better than having um, an absolute barren setting, so I'm glad to see the collectibles being scattered very cleverly throughout the levels. The post-game content is very sour and a rather mixed bag since the grand majority of it is lazily slapped in repeats of the same levels and missions with only... Um, changed up alternate objectives to add further challenges to the stuff that you've done already. I love this game. I think it's great. It's definitely a huge innovation and a great step in the right direction for the Skarnas franchise. And considering the interactivity with the physical toys and how that impacts your gaming experience to help make combat more fleshed out and really fun to interact with, but I just feel as though the game is too dull and uninspired in comparison to other Skarnas games to be considered as anything other than a great game. But that basically does it for my Skarnas Swap Force review. Again, it's a great game, I love it, it has a close place to my heart, but I can't call it a, a step ahead of being anything other than great. And the gameplay this time round was recorded by yours truly, therefore I own it. And now that's all been said and done, this video is coming to an end. I hope you enjoyed and I'll be seeing you tomorrow for my Trap Team review. And until that moment rises, peace! And thank you so much as always for watching.